So we know with our postbiotic products that, that they do both, that they have a microbiome modulating effect and an uh, uh, immunomodulatory effect. Um, and so the, the inclusion of the, uh, the, the saponin-based product too, um, there's a lot of evidence in the literature that, that these saponins have uh, antibactericidal effects, uh, antiviral right. effects, immunomodulus. So a lot of the same overall pathways, if you will. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Poultry Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. I'm your host, Kelly Wamsley, and I'm joined today with, by Dr. Evan Cheney. Welcome, Evan. Hi, Kelly. Thank you for having me. Thanks for joining us. Um, so let's, just before we get into a couple things, um, let me give a little bit of your background. So you're from Texas Tech, or mm-hmm. your schooling was in Texas Tech. Are you a Texan? Correct. I am a Texan by birth. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Very good. And um, and so then you have um, you're now at Diamond V. And what's your current position and responsibilities there? Yep. So so Diamond V um, in in Cargill uh, Cargill uh, Animal Nutrition and in our Micronutrition and Health Solutions Group. Um, I do sit on the dime, what would be the Diamond V or the postbiotics team, and my, my title is Food Safety Technology uh, Lead. Um, and so I'm really focused on uh, food safety technologies that we think of application in the pre-harvest or live production side environment. Okay, very good. Well, um, before we get into uh, kind of talking about what we're going to talk about today, um, just a quick, I got a quick this or that, and and then a question to start us off, okay? All right. Mountain or beach? Ooh, mountain. Drum or drumette? Uh, drum. Dog or cat? Definitely a dog. Fried or scrambled egg? Oh, uh, fried. Definitely a fried egg. I'm, I'm more of a fried, too. Okay. Now, my big question, which is going to be the most important one of the podcast. Okay, if you were in a zombie apocalypse, um, what poultry professional would you take with you and why? Oh, there's a lot of wonderful poultry professionals out there that I both get to work with and know in the industry. She'll get a kick out of this. I might take Christine Alvarado. She's feisty, uh, very knowledgeable, uh, and and well known. So I think she she'd be great to have on the zombie apocalypse. Yep. Yeah, I agree. She's and she's good, you know, at conversations and you know, never a dull moment. I'm sure that would happen in in the zombie apocalypse with Christine. <laughs> there you go. Hi, Christine, if you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay, so. Evan, we're going to talk about some research that uh, you recently presented at IPSF. Um, And so kind of interesting when I'm looking at this, you know, your food safety background, and then you're doing research in Apec E. coli. Can you give me a little bit of background, fill me in on where that, you know, jump net comes from? Sure, absolutely. So I've spent, um, well, my formal academic training and then uh, the first kind of few years of my career postgraduate working in various aspects of both pre and post harvest food safety, largely salmonella um, across industries and across different species. Um, But when I joined Diamond V and and Cargill, uh, we were really focused at the time on looking at some of our postbiotic products and their efficacy uh, as a pre harvest food safety intervention, right? So we're trying to see do feeding these products uh, reduce colonization potential of salmonella in poultry, et cetera. Um, salmonella, and, and we've successfully done that. There's um, a, a large body of both in vitro and in vivo evidence for, for that. Um, so avian pathogenic E. coli obviously is a, is a large challenge for the global poultry industry. Um, and taxonomically, phylo, uh, phylogenetically, right? Salmonella and E. coli are not too distant from each other. They so share a lot of uh, genetic characteristics, um, and so it's not a, a huge leap. It's it's fairly logical to say, well, might we have an impact with these products uh, in poultry? 
Um, and so that's kind of where we started our, our venture and me being a, and I highlight applied microbiologist um, <laughs> from the food safety side, I, I've just had the privilege of being able to work with my colleagues uh, to address this problem. And so, uh, yeah, I'm making that little bit of a jump from applied food safety microbiology to the avian pathogenic E. coli, which, it, which is a little bit more, um, you know, animal health and welfare type focused, but also there are some uh, indications or concerns that there might be a zoonotic risk there too. So it's still a little bit foodborne uh, or food safety oriented. Uh, yeah, sure. No, and, and it doesn't, it makes sense, right? Um, I mean, you know, bacteria is bacteria. And, or, and so I guess, you know, if we're concerned about it for humans, I mean, obviously we need to be concerned about the, the health of the bird also, because if we're not concerned about the health of the bird, they're not growing properly, um, then, you know, we're not, we're going to not get any kind of return on our investment. Um, so, uh, very, very good field and interesting field. Um, so the, so moving on to your study, so you worked with broilers and you had some that were challenged and not challenged and then mm -hmm. supplemented, um, with this, um, with this product, gut health product. So can you talk a little bit about the challenge and the gut health product specifically? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, so um, as just a short background, when we when we started our kind of foray into this, this area with uh, the postbiotic products, um, we started off uh, with our, our, what I would call our core postbiotic, uh, which has been on the market for, for many years. And we funded a study with some UGA faculty to, to initially explore. And they did a, an isolator type challenge with uh, some S SPF uh, leghorn birds. Um, they challenged those birds orally and intratracheally with uh, the APEC 078 isolate. And what we saw in that, it was a control diet versus the diet supplemented with our postbiotic. And, and there were... Uh, mean uh, lesion score reductions, as well as uh, APEC loads within various tissue samples. And so that was kind of the first, oh, well, we should continue down this path. Sure. Um, so uh, at the time we had some other colleagues and, and innovation leads uh, within our, our group, um, and they started to formulate a uh, prototype product. And so it was taking the core postbiotic in a phytogenic, which is the uh, Kilaya uh, saponin, and combined these into a new formulation that we, we thought might have an increased magnitude of effect uh, in this area of APEC. So if I can interrupt you for one moment. So I guess adding that um, phyto, uh, phytogenic type product, is that, what, what's the thought process on how that's going to enhance the mode of action of the postbiotic pro product? Sure, that, that's a great question. Um, I think, uh, you know, we don't know too terribly much about how a lot of these uh, products actually, you know, from a mode of action perspective. We know that there's impacts to the microbiome. We know that there's immunomodulatory effects, but necessarily uh, understanding each of those pathways in fine detail, right? Um, that's It's kind of a new area, right? Um, so we know with our postbiotic products that, that they do both, that they have a microbiome modulating effect and an uh, uh, immunomodulatory effect. Um, and so the the inclusion of the uh, the, the saponin-based product too, um, there's a lot of evidence in the literature that that these saponins have um, antibactericidal -bac effects, uh, antiviral effects, right. immunomodulation. So a lot of the same overall pathways, if you will. And so kind of combining these two products, um, maybe we're hitting on some 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 different ones, uh, so to speak. I always go back to, I'm an applied microbiologist. So the folks who like to get very granular uh, on these mechanisms, I, I stay in my wheelhouse. <laughs> yeah, no, and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty applied myself. And so, um, and I know that there are, um, the, the microbiome though too, is, it's such a, uh, it is such a vast um, opportunity for us to learn a lot more about. And um, really, like you said, like some of these products, gut health products, and just trying to um, really pinpoint, you know, just so that from a consistency standpoint that you know um, that you're going to be able to, you know, 
see something. Um, and so uh, that's definitely important um, when you're thinking about making an investment um, as a product. And some of these gut health products can get pretty expensive, but um, if the return is there, then, and you know, it's preventing a disease that's extremely costly to the industry, um, like APEC E. coli can um, do and others, then, then that's something that's a really important for, um, for us to be, you know, learning about for sure. Absolutely. So what you found um, was when you supplemented um, this combination of products that you saw a reduction in lesions. Um, is, that, is that right? Can you expand upon that just a little bit? Exactly. So we, we had taken those original findings and done one one other study uh, that that was underpowered. Um, it was a aerosolized APEC challenge. So we knew we needed to do another larger pen study with a different, more, uh, you know, a challenge that would actually uh, uh, have the power to show treatment differences. So sure. um, that led us into the pen challenge that we're discussing here, where we had uh, four pins per treatment. We had five treatments. So we had our, our unchallenged controls, our challenge controls, uh, a group with just receiving this prototype postbiotic. Uh, we had a vaccine control group and then a co-administered treatment group. So uh, vaccine plus the uh, the prototype product. And so four pins per treatment, 30 birds per pin, um, challenged at day 28 intratracheally, um, which is the most severe uh way to administer the challenge with APEC 07. Sure. And then we, we necropsied uh, and, and took all of our samples uh, on day 35. So challenge day 28, first sampling day 35. And then uh, the study was terminated at day 42. So we looked at uh, mean lesion scores for parahepatitis, pericarditis, air saculitis, and uh, a bird level cumulative score, uh, which is just the summation of, of those lesions. Uh, and then we actually looked at the uh, the APEC uh, pathogen loads in different tissues, so lung tissue, liver tissue, as well as air sac and uh, pericardium swabs. Um, and then we had blood samples that we looked at uh, uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines. So um, that was kind of the experiment. Yeah, really looking at it from um, just different angles to be able to try to grasp, you know, where... Um, the benefit, if, if any, is coming from and to make sure that your challenge was there and appropriate, right? Correct. And that's really important. Um, so I guess for recommendations from moving on from this study, so what did you find um, that was noteworthy and kind of the building steps to get to something like a performance or some other type of um, study similar? Sure. So uh, what we saw in this study were, were with the post, well, all treatments, I should say first, all treatments um, did reduce mean uh, lesion scores, either in some cases significantly, in some cases uh, just numerically. Um, so we did see significant reductions for the prototype for parahepatitis compared to the control. And those uh, numerical differences approach significance for pericarditis and air saculitis as well. Uh, what was interesting is we saw that the APEC loads in for lung, like lung tissue, for example, with postbiotic were significantly reduced over control. So there appears to be some type of correlation between severity of lesions, the amount of APEC that's actually uh, able to invade and go systemic and yeah. be in those tissues. So uh, it's very interesting from that perspective. Um, ultimately, at the end of the day, what we saw is that the, the prototype was effective in, in helping support the bird's health and reduce the severity of disease. Um, and it was, and this is, a, I think, an important point, is it wasn't antagonistic when co-administered with the vaccine. Um, so this adds uh, another tool in the toolbox, potentially, for sure. producers and veterinarians and nutritionists to help kind of mitigate that APEC risk up front, um, particularly if there are unknown serotypes of, of APEC that maybe we're not vaccinating against or, or emerging uh, different strains uh, of APEC, um, this might be an additional uh, protective factor. So our, our next steps are to continue um, since we've seen these positive outcomes and we're gonna look at uh, application in, in other poultry species. 
Um, so we'll go, now that we have the broiler data, we'll do some layer work. We're gonna do some turkey work. Um, and we'll continue to, to look at, at how we um, research the, these products efficacy with our, of course the performance aspect as well. Elevate bird well-being and improve profitability with Cargill's tailored nutrient solutions that deliver performance. Cargill is leading through applied nutrition, leveraging deep nutrient insights and understanding of the animal's nutrient requirements to achieve your production and performance goals. Oh, that's really interesting. And then to think that, I mean, you have a product um, that at least the portion of the product has been effective with salmonella and, you know, exactly. some other challenge work and improving performance and then kind of adding in this um, phytogenic and then being able to test it against another disease um, that is really costly for the industry. Um, just really uh, neat to be able to be able to kind of say that, hey, you've got um, you're kind of covering a gamut um, potentially of um, potential disease or food safety concerns too. Even so, you're right. We we moved into the food safety area. <laughs> There's no silver bullet, right? But I I like to. Uh, I think sometimes people talk about a silver shotgun shell, right? So it's yeah, we're, that's right. We're using all these approaches <laughs> and and hopefully making incremental improvements across the board. So yep. silver shotgun shell. I like it. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Okay, well, I think that's about all that we have today. Um, I've just got one more question for you, Evan. Um, since we are the Poultry Nutrition Black Belt Podcast, which one, uh, Jackie Chan or Chuck Norris? Oh, Chuck Norris all the way. Walker, Texas Ranger, yeah. Uh, yeah, of course, Texan. <laughs> and he's a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Black Belt, so. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> awesome, well. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today, Evan, and thank you all for tuning in. Uh, this has been another episode of the Poultry Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. And si see you next time. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you. Bye.